Hey everybody, this is Craig Garber. Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar. I got an awesome guest today with John Andrasik. Most people know him as Five for Fighting. I want to give a quick shout out to Julie Lichtenstein for hooking us up. Thanks, Julie, you're a sweetheart. Uh, just a quick cliff notes on, on John. He's best selling, a platinum selling multi instrumentalist, singer, songwriter. To me, this guy's a fabulous songwriter, very much in the classic songwriters of the 60s and 70s, Elton John, Neil Diamond. You're actually, your voice sometimes sounds like Neil Diamond, too, on some of these tracks. Yeah. Um, John's released six studio albums, has several hundred music licensing placements, many in well-known TV shows and movies. He co-manages his family's business called Precision Wire Products. They're the number one, I think, shopping cart maker in the country. Is that correct? We're not one more, number one, but we make a lot of them, that's for sure. Yeah. Right, they make shopping. That's a hell of a niche business, too. Um, he's, an in, he's also an in-demand keynote speaker. I would encourage you to watch his TEDx presentation as well as some others out there. John's also heavily involved in a number of charitable causes. I would encourage you to check out his website or Wikipedia and the website whatkindofworlddoyouwant.com for more information to help support these causes. And just a heads up for those of you who are big fans of John's, we're not going to talk about his biggest hits today, only because there's so many interviews out there. He's done those. I didn't want to be redundant and uh, ask him the same questions that he's been asked a thousand times. So uh, thanks so much, John, for coming on the show. I really appreciate your time. Craig, it's great to be with you. Thanks for having me. Oh, man. Uh, okay, so your mom was a piano teacher, and you started on piano at the ripe old age of two <laughs> which you <laughs> you played, which is like when I heard that, I was like, what? Uh, which you played until 13, then you got more into sports, which you're still a big sports fan. Shortly after that, you started writing your own songs, and you were quite prolific as a writer right from the start. Uh, I was curious, was there like a particular experience that was critical to you becoming a musician? I don't think so. I, you know, I... I've always had a passion for music, um, and as a teenager, found my passion for songwriting. But I was fortunate to have, yes, my mom was a <clears throat> USC piano major. As you mentioned, she started me very young. I, I kind of had the aptitude, and, and um, but, you know, of course, she learned very quickly that you don't teach your kid piano. I was so. impressed by that, man, when well, I heard it, that. It, it didn't last very long. She had a very good friend who was a piano teacher, so we, they traded kids. So, <laughs> so, so I would go to her friends for piano, so I'd have to be a little more respectful, and she would teach her kids. But my dad was an astrophysicist, so um, he was going off to JPL every day, NASA every day. So I kind of had this musical mom, this kind of engineer, brilliant dad. So it was, um, it was really wonderful, you know, to, to grow up in that household and and I just um, you know very early on I started playing Stephen Schwartz you know Godspell and Burt Bacharach songbooks and then got you know the Beatle songbook that was as thick as a phone book yeah <laughs> <laughs> and um, and I just love playing you know and I just love I've loved um, I love songs like every you know everybody else and we would sing Carly Simon on the way to camping trips and, and uh, James Taylor. And, uh, but as you mentioned, you know, when I was 13 and I wanted to chase girls and ride my skateboard and play basketball, really didn't want to practice anymore uh, the piano. Um, and she was wise. She said, okay, yeah, if you have the passion for it, do it. If not, you have the fundamentals. You can, you know, play for your grandkids one day. And, and I just fell in love with songwriting. I just started, you know, kind of writing songs at 15 and uh, have been scrounging ever since, you know, for, for a better and better song. Awesome. Awesome, man. Uh, I heard you say in an interview, which I found really refreshing, that much of your songwriting, especially early on, was driven creatively by a chip on your shoulder. <laughs> and I was able to relate to that because, like, I guess I always called it righteous indignation has pushed me and allowed me to accomplish quite a lot, also especially in my younger days. So to whatever extent you're comfortable, what was that chip and how did it get there? Well, look, I think if you're in the arts, you understand that. Um, the arts is basically an exercise in how to handle rejection. There are few, <laughs> you know, you know, there, there are few, well you know, few child prodigies that, that have success very early and can sustain that. Um, that brings its own challenges. But yeah, I think... Uh, 
everybody who listens to this as you know who who does the arts um just you know their goal is to be heard um people may like it people may not like it but i think um so many folks just want to be heard just give me the chance you know just just listen and uh for 99.9 percent of us that is very hard to do and and uh I think so much of success in any profession, not just music, has very little to do with talent. Um, it has a lot to do with will <laughs> yeah. and perseverance. And I agree. how do you handle rejection? I mean, look, Superman um, really was a woe is me. Uh, it's not easy to be me. You know, and when you're a young songwriter hitting the wall and you're a good songwriter, not a very good singer. You're a good singer, not a very good songwriter. It's like you, you hit, you know, everybody has a reason to pass on you. You feel that, you know, what the hell? You know, it's, it's not easy to be me. Um, of course, you know, years later, I could never write that song. You learn that it's actually pretty easy to be most of us. Maybe we don't get our dreams to come true. But, but as a young songwriter, I think um, that's a sentiment that makes sense. And all of us share it an even. Um, even if we do happen to have success, that never really goes away. That insecurity never goes away. So, so yeah, I think um, I still have a chip on my shoulder. I think if you talk to, you know, I know a lot of athletes. And if, as soon as you kind of lose that, I think you do lose your edge. And yeah. um, you just don't want to let it consume you, right? That's the thing. It's yeah, like you, want, you don't want it to, like, take your life down. You, you don't want to be, you know, just angry and depressed all the time. But I think um, you have to have some ego and you have to have some confidence. And you, if you use that chip right, that it can serve you well. Yeah. It's like the Spider-Man thing. With great power comes great responsibility, right? <laughs> That's right. What was your first break and how did that come about? Huh. Well, I mean, there's always kind of little things along the way that you look back on and go, oh, if that didn't happen if that didn't happen, but I guess, I'm going to tell you two, okay? I'm going to tell you yeah. two, because um, one, I think um, your audience will enjoy, and the other uh, was a fun story. The first one was uh, out of college. Um, I was living in Malibu in, in a friend's apartment, and um, I went to the pool one day, and there were two guys sitting, you know, by the pool. I could tell they were rockers. They had long hair, had the wristbands, had the stuff. And we were just talking. And I was a young kid. And they were a little, you know, in their late 30s. And it turns out uh, one of them was a guy named Rudy Sarzo, who you oh, know. Oh, yeah. I had Rudy on the show yeah. here. Usually. And another guy yeah. was Scott Sheets, who was sure. the guitar player for um, Pat Benatar. He wrote Fire and Ice. And so, long story short, we began talking. And... Um, and Rudy, you know, because we're there every day, kind of takes me under his wing and um, starts to mentor me, befriend me, listen to some of my songs. And I had this almost famous experience where I was this little kid. And this is when Rudy was, Rudy was in White Snake at the top of White Snake's, you know, is this love? Here I go again. So, you know, rock stardom. And mm -hmm. so he would start bringing me around. He would bring me to shows and he would take me up the elevator and I'd just kind of follow around and and um, and Rudy turned out is what was a closet Barry Manilow Barry Manilow fan. So he loved piano. He loved songs. And Scott also kind of like um, we started working with Scott and and actually we formed a band. Me and Scott Sheets, John Scott, it was called. I was 22. He was 40. And then a couple other members of Pat Benatar's old band kind of joined. So it was literally me with Pat Benatar's old band. And we would go in the studio and we, we cut songs and Rudy would come in. And so I had these wonderful rock star kind of mentors um, that were giving me confidence. And, and of course, the songs were not typically what I do now. They were more like, you know, Bon Jovi, kind of that pop rock. But we wrote some good songs and we got a manager and we were kind of on our way. And then um, this little band called Nirvana came out and that whole thing ended, you know, overnight. Right. But um but those relationships were really important to me to kind of introduce me to the music business, give me some confidence, have some mentors. And um, so after that, you know, I went back to the piano and I started kind of writing kind of the stuff you hear now. And, and of course, struggling and, you know, trying to get a gig anywhere. So the second story is um, I was playing in a piano bar 
<clears throat> on Melrose and, and Vine, believe it or not. And, uh, you know, it's back in the day where you pay to play. And if, if there's not 20 people there, you're not playing next week. So I would always kind of ask my friends to come. And, sure. and one night there was five people there, and that includes the guy making coffee. It was called the 8120 Room. It was under the coconut teaser. L.A. folks will remember that. And, um, <clears throat> and I noticed um, a woman kind of come in the back of the room and sit there and kind of go like this. And I'm like, I don't know that person. I didn't pay her to be here. That's interesting. And after, um, after the uh, show, she came up and said, hey, you know, I'm, I'm Carla Berkowitz. I, uh, at the time, she worked for, um, <clears throat> it wasn't EMI Publishing. It was one of the other publishing companies. And uh, she said, you know, I get people record deals. I heard some of your stuff. And um, I'd like to work with you. And I'd, I'd heard that many times before. But uh, the, the funny story was she was actually at Motown pitching songs at Motown. And I had a girlfriend that worked at Motown, a secretary, who was playing my songs on her desk. And Carla said, who's that? That's and the crazy. A&R guy at Motown said, it's this guy. He plays at the piano bar. Everybody's passed on him. You know, nobody's. It. Even my lawyer <laughs> behind my back was telling people everybody's passing on me. But anyway, so, so Carla um, worked with me for a couple of years. Eventually got me a record deal at uh, EMI Records. Uh, she worked at EMI Publishing. And um, she's now been my wife. will be 27 years this September. Dude, I love that story. So, I, I read that. Uh, so, yeah. it was so, so she's, awesome. she Certainly she was one of my big breaks. But it wasn't yeah. just her. There, there were five. Another, I'm sorry. The last one, let me tell you, was there was a kid named Greg Latterman at the time who had a, a little sub-label called Aware Records. And he was just out of college. And he would put out these samplers that would always have the next best, best, you know, the next hit thing. He put out a sampler with Hootie, and then they become Hootie, and then Train, Train, Matchbox 20, Matchbox 20. And he also uh, kind of found me early and put me on one of these samplers, and he was kind of my avenue through Columbia Records. So I think, you know, those, those three times, me, meeting Carla, um, my mentors with, with Scott and Rudy, and then Greg Latterman taking a shot on me when everyone else had passed, you know, those were defining moments but there's there's dozens you know Th sure. this whole thing could have collapsed and at any moment mm -hmm. yeah that was cool man thank you for sharing those are good stories man yeah uh we mentioned this before uh, we were ro rolling uh you mentioned that little things often turn into big things and you just shared some of those examples anything else come to mind when you said that expression the biggest one for me is superman um yeah. you know when i wrote superman it was a gift. It came very quickly. Um, but at the time, you know, I fancied myself as a rocker, you know, listening to The Who and, you know, Queen and, you know, uh, taking voice lessons from Steve Perry's voice teacher. You know, I, that I kind of my image was that, you know, I, I couldn't do the David Lee Roth kicks, but I was trying. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and um, and so um, most of the songs I was writing was, you know, kind of rock, you know, pop rock, rock songs. And uh, when I wrote Superman, I'm like, yeah, it's, I, I get it. I think it's cool. Um, but maybe it's something I should give to Celine or James Taylor. Or, you know, I, I, I had a publisher at the time. And maybe it's something we pitch to someone else. But to this day, I'll always be grateful to Greg Wattenberg, my producer, who kept saying, John, you know, we have to put that little song on your record. We even called it a little song. Because uh, it was just this little, this little ballad. You know, we were working, you know, nights and days on these big productions and arrangements and guitar solos and here was this little ballad and then when we started to record it i think we got a sense of okay maybe we have something special here um but we almost didn't put it on this that record and that you know and, and that little song became something no one i could never imagine so i do think it's a lesson learned very early about um you know these things that seem trivial in some respects you know, are, are often the most important things. And I, I talk, you know, sometimes in my keynotes about COVID, right? I think COVID was a, in, in many ways a certain, uh, not just a catastrophic event for the country, but also a, a mind shift for so many people um, who, who, who couldn't have dinner with their mother, um, yeah. who, who couldn't go out of their house, who couldn't, um, you know, who couldn't, you know, do the things we do every day but a lot of us had our kids at our table for the first time in 10 years. My mom and dad had a second honeymoon. And so I think we found out that a lot of these things we took for granted for so long are really, at the end of the day, 
the important things and and um, and the stuff we are consumed with every day. Maybe they're they're not um, they're not what we thought they were. So I, I think I think that that sentiment of get the little things right and the big things will take care of themselves. Yeah. I think I think we've all kind of um, reflected on that, you know, since um, since the pandemic. Let me ask you something. You mentioned a little bit ago. You said about a lot of your success to be successful in any profession has to do with will. At the same time, by you not being willful, you listened to your producer and you said, "Okay, I'll put the record. I'll put this little song, yeah, on the record." How have you balanced, like, being willful and letting things happen organically? Because, you know, I know I had to. Uh, I was old, most of my life. I was very willful, and when I stopped it, everything got like the sunshine so it was just a pretty amazing change how have you balanced that that's an interesting question um i think um certainly i've i've had a small group of advisors around me that i trust and um you know when they come to a consensus i certainly listen to them and uh, i also i think it was helpful for me that I had success at a very late age when it comes to the music business. Yeah. I wasn't 18, I wasn't 19, I wasn't like, hey, it's all me. I, I've already knew that it wasn't me, and you know, so many people had to support me to even have a chance. So, so I, was, I was open to listening and, and, um, and reason, and, and, um, and you know, sometimes I probably took some advice I shouldn't have, but you know, right. I, was, I was young, but the, uh, the story I tell, um, a lot too about how do you make some of these decisions is uh, when my song Chances, I wrote Chances, um, you know, of course, you're always looking for a big license for your single, and it was tempted in a big blockbuster movie, and um, everybody was excited, and then I was sent a script of another movie that was much smaller, and uh, but I loved it, and long story short, I ended up pulling from the big, you know, the big movie, putting this little movie that no one was going to see. And uh, everyone was angry with me, with me, my wife, the label, my manager, you're crazy. And, um, but something in my gut kind of said, this song was meant for this film. And it, in this case, it worked out because that was the blind side and it became the biggest sports <laughs> movie in history. Yeah, um, great movie. But it doesn't always work out, of course. Um, but I find the times where you don't trust your gut and it goes off the edge, that's what keeps you up at night. You're like, oh my yeah. God, you know. The times that you trust your gut and it explodes in your face, you're like, that's the price of doing business. You know, yeah. if you're not failing, if you're not, if there's not disasters, if you don't have stories of, you know, of embarrassment, then you're not pushing uh, the envelope and fulfilling your potential. So I, I always kind of say now, you know, yeah, I don't, you know, if it gets down to like, you know, the nitty gritty, what does your gut say? And um, go with it. Yeah. And uh, whatever happens, happens. So again, I, it took me 20 years to learn that, but that's kind of, uh, Dude, that's such an important... That's my don't note. you wish you had that when you were like 20 years old? Oh, I wish I had a lot of things at 20... At 40 years old. <laughs> at 40, right, 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 man. I'm with yeah. you on that. Hey, I want to talk about some of my uh, favorite songs of yours. Uh, let's start with 100 Years from the Battle for Everything. In an interview, you said that the song is about living in the moment, and I was curious, how do you rate yourself as far as being able to live in the moment, and what sort of mindset or triggers do you use to make sure when you catch yourself you know in the past or in the future what sort of triggers do you have or mechanisms to bring yourself back i rate myself for, i rate myself very poorly um <laughs> hence the song um i uh certainly you know like so many of us you know particularly men you know we um have this you know tendency to dwell in the past and relive every decision and then future trip, right? Um, future always, trip and how, how, let's move the goalposts. And for me, I think, and I've said this before, I, I don't think I write 100 Years or The Riddle um, or many of these songs um, without kids. You know, I had my two little kids. Superman had become this big thing. I was living my dream, wonderful wife, wonderful family, wonderful parents. You know, and of course, what am I doing every day? I'm lamenting my decisions. I should have done this, or we have to look to this. And one day I'm sitting with my kids on my lap on the couch, and it kind of, you know, sometimes these things just hit you. Like, you know, they've been happening every day for years, and then one day it just 
Mike Tyson you, right? They just knock yes. you out. Like, I'm like, what am I doing? I'm like, you know, um, I like, look who's sitting here, you know, on my lap. Um, I'm blessed to live in the best country in the world. I have a song people know. Yeah. Can you at least for five seconds go, okay, I, I recognize this. I appreciate this. And also at times where things are not great, when things are bad, when things, you know, um, when, when things are tough, recognize that. Recognize that it's not always going to be this way, but, you know, this, the, it's such a cliche, but the moment is what we have, right? That's it, man. Um, the moment is what we have. And, and um, a lot of these songs, I think, for me, are little post-it notes to myself. You know, hey, dude. You know, and so every time I sing that song, I kind of re-reflect on where I am, what I'm doing. Um, and I think that's why that song became so popular because so many of us struggle, you know, doing these cliches. They're cliches for a reason, right? right. But, um, but yeah, I'm not, you know, I find myself, catch myself all the time. You know, it's, it's one thing to talk the talk. It's another to walk the walk. A, yeah, lot of of these, a lot of the stuff I say in my keynote, I'm like, yeah, they're, I think they're good, um, good, good, good uh, advice. But half the time, I'm not taking my own advice. But that's, you know, we're human, right. and, and we, we, we just keep growing and doing the best we can with what we got. Yeah, doing the best you can. You know, it's interesting. Once I became, uh, like, spiritually aware and started having a faith in the higher power, I started going back over my life, and I realized that all the things that happened that were what I thought were negative, such a positive came out of it. So I came up with this thing, and I say this every morning. When I wake up, it says, I just say, I'm Craig Garber, and only good things happen to me. And oh. I say that throughout the day to remind myself that sometimes, you know, so that my reactions to things won't be so extreme if there is a disappointment or if things don't go the, the, way I, the way I thought they should go, which how the hell do I know? Maybe that's happening for the best, and there have been things that have happened for the best reasons. So I say this every day, and I, I even come up, the reminders come up during the day to keep, because I really, you know, that, that helps me out a lot, keep me sort of like in the moment, man, because it is a tough, it's a challenge, big challenge. Yeah, one thing I appreciate about the kind of Buddhist philosophy is um, everything is in your mind. Uh, you know, man. It, it, whatever happens, it's how you react to it and yeah. how you take it in. And it's, because uh, most people in the outside world don't care. <laughs> about what, right. Not, no one's going to bed thinking about you. At night. No one's thinking about yeah. your problems right now. So mm -hmm. if you're thinking about them and everything, it's like, you know, they don't care you're suffering. And right. it, it, again, it's, it's tough. It's hard to live that way. I th again, I think, especially for, for men. Um, and I've, I've kind of gone to some of these Buddha classes. Again, I'm not a super religious person, but I'm, I think I'm a spiritual person. It's, yeah. I always find it interesting that a lot of religious symbolism end up in my songs. You know, I have a song called If God Made You, probably my best lyric. If God made you, he's in love with me. I'm not a, you know, practicing Christian. I'm not an atheist, but I think we all are, you know, looking for something, a higher power. And uh, so much of our happiness or whatever that is, or our quest for happiness is in our mind and how we, how we um, deal with controversy and bad things happening to us and and tragedy also. Yeah. And again, it's tough, but um, whenever I kind of, you know, kind of start feeling manic or whatever, I kind of just, okay, I'm breathing in, I'm breathing out, I'm sitting here. Sometimes I find myself doing that on stage too, to like, to, to kind of recognize how great, bad, ugly, amazing it's happening right now, to just kind of look what's happening right now. And we rarely do that. We very rarely do that. That breathing thing is pretty phenomenal because you could be in the midst of any kind of deep shit and if you just stop and like take 10 breaths, I don't know what the hell, it's almost like a drug. All of the, you know, it's, <laughs> no, it, it's real, I mean, I, it's yeah. like, you know, it's pretty freaking cool. I'm with, uh, no, I'm with you, you know, again, little things become big things. <laughs> it's like, yeah. sometimes just take a breath and, you know, I'm breathing in, I'm breathing out, okay. Uh, yeah, I, you know, totally, man. <laughs> story of your life off slice i was yeah. curious the back what's the backstory to the lyrics in that track because i was wondering 
if these were just if these were lessons that you learn like you can run but you won't get away no one knows what's coming up you're very practical in your outlook on things you're like very realistic you know in your lyrics right um like with these lessons you learn that you just put them into the context of this woman's life or was this about a particular person this was about my wife it was um, yeah, yeah she uh she would always say, "You never write songs about me," and I'm like, "I wrote something. <laughs> I wrote something about you, about you." She's like, "No, you didn't." And uh, so this one, yeah, this one was about uh, Carla. She had a, a pretty tough childhood. Um, had to kind of evacuate uh, Long Island in the middle of the night when she was 14 because um, bad guys were after her dad. She oh, ended up shit. staying staying with um, some people she didn't know for a year. Uh, put herself in college at 16, you know, came out to L.A., you know, in her early 20s with a guy she married and and kind of had some tough times with that. And but through all that, you know, she she learned the fortitude to be able to take care of yourself and to work and to become one of the most powerful uh, music publishers in the music business. And um, so, you know, that song was a testament to her as well as some of the lessons, not just that she learned through that, but I think that, that everybody can, can take from it. So yeah, that is, that is her song. And, uh, cool, man. and, uh, you know, I think she, uh, she wants more, but you know, there's still time. <laughs> <laughs> Great track, man. Thank you. Uh, let's talk about the day I die, which is one of yeah. my all time. And I mean that sincerely, everybody listen to this. This is a phenomenal song. It's off the bookmarks record. Um, the song is about a guy who's basically narrating the last day of his life. And then after he passes, he's still narrating it after he dies. So I have a bunch of questions. And the first one was, I thought that was such an amazingly clever plot, like storyline. How did, what was the spark for that? How did you come up with that? You know, I don't know. I mean, I think, you know, there's so many paths to songwriting. You know, some is you write a lyric, right. some you, you're sitting at the piano, you find a melody, and some are a concept. You know, what's a concept? You know, 100 years was an idea, a concept. And, but I think the day I died, um, kind of like, you know, in a way kind of like Superman, you take kind of this kind of symbol and twist it. It's like, you know, imagine being someone, um, knowing you're on your your deathbed and it's the last day of your life and it's your last sunrise and it's the last sundown and you see the stars come out for the last time and and you're with your loved one you're with your you're with your life partner and yeah certainly that that can be a very sad situation but it's also a joyful one if you're if you've lived a, a, a good life and and yeah and you're with someone you love and and you're you're looking back. You see, you know the line. You see your kid in the chair. Um, I think we all are. You know, religion is basically fear of death <laughs> in many in many res in many to, respects. You it's know like, what? You're right. Is, is there something more? You know, is is there something more? So I think we all think about our mortality, um, and and I think it's in it's. I'm gl I'm glad you brought that song up to me. You know, in in your note you sent to me before. Because I hadn't listened to it in probably six or seven years, and I listened to it this morning, and um, and hearing hearing it this morning made me a little bit emotional um, for a few reasons. Yeah. You know, one because I really hadn't heard, I, I really hadn't remembered a lot of the lyrics. Um, I'm in a different place than when I wrote it, and also I believe it was the last song of Bookmarks, which was the last record record I ever released. I've re released songs since then. So it was kind of the last song of the last record, you know, for me, which again is melancholy. But um, yeah, it's, it's, um, it, it really hit me that, that it made, you know, an impact on you and, and your life oh. in, 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 in profound ways. And, um, and listening to it today, <laughs> I was like, you know, it, I, I had some similar sentiments that you did um, of yeah. am I doing what I want to be doing because one day I'm going to be singing that song, you know, or thinking that song and we're all going to be in that in that bed with that chair and hopefully we have the love of our life with us and we're going to see that. Yeah, that last sunrise. I know it's such a I mean, just a, a beautiful track. Um, 
I gotta, I'm getting emotional now a little bit, so let me get my shit together. Uh, <laughs> were some of those sto- storylines autobiographical in nature, like when you wake up in the morning and the woman says, you said good morning, are you free? Were you envisioning your wife saying that to you at the time? Or like, yeah, you were? Yeah, you know, maybe, you know, probably your wife, maybe it's your child, you know, and, and yeah. to me the line, you know, are you free means are you at peace? You know, with with oh, your life, okay. with what you've done, um, with are are you ready to go? Um, are you okay. free of the fear? Um, but of course, the great thing about songs, and a lot of times, you know, I don't necessarily give my you know strict interpretation of this is what I'm saying, this is what I'm doing, this is what it means, because it really doesn't matter what yeah. I, how I wrote it. It's the the beauty of music is how people take it and apply it to their lives and how they need it mm. or how they hear it. And this actually uh, was made clear to me again early in my career when Superman and Hundred Years were popular. I, I was corresponding with many of our troops, you know, particularly during the Iraq war um, overseas, in a, you know, many of them in theater, in battle, and, and they would send me notes, you know, I listen to your song to calm down after a mission, or I listen to your song to pump up after a mission, or I, I listen to your song to think of home. Um, and so they would use the same song in so many different circumstances, and it meant to them something so different than other people. So I learned that, you know, if you're blessed enough to have a song that people know, uh, it doesn't really matter what I think or what I was writing about. It's what they apply to their lives that it, that has meaning, and that's the beauty about music, right? Um, yeah, sure. Unlike, is. In, unlike I think any other medium. Yeah, I agree with you. Well, even the, uh, like, there was little, I just was so, the little bits of wisdom in the song, like, you know, the guy's, you know, the, he's almost implying I'm not ready, and, they, and then, you know, presumably God or some higher power says, you know all you need, you need all you know. Yeah. That was like, fuck, that's great. <laughs> you know, like, it, it, like you don't have a choice, man. So you know all you need. You need all yeah. you know. You're, you're getting yeah. on the bus whether yeah, you're ready right. or not. You know, I Plain thought that was so off. cool. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Um, and I also thought your description of what would happen after you died was so accurate. When you, you, know, you talk about the day I died, the planet shrugged and moved along. A few people noticed and sang my song, and man, that's just how it goes, you know, especially nowadays more than ever where, you know, the next flashy thing will come up on this stupid phone and, you know, people will be diverted. And that was just, in even the, you know, uh, my smile hit a few lies. I mean, it was just like, I, I, it's just like the perfect song. It was just so tapped into, like, human nature. I thought it was just amazing. Uh, and thank you for writing that, man. Um, and uh, to me, this song is just such a powerful reminder of, you know, the importance of just enjoying every day you're above grass, you know? No, there, there's a line in the riddle similar that, that basically talks about, you know, in, this, in, in the nature of things in the universe, we are the speck of a speck of a speck. We're like, we're so irrelevant and such a small little thing. But to ourselves, we're, every, we're everything. We're, yeah. In our own life, you know, in our own mind, this we are everything we are the universe right so this dichotomy of we're everything to ourselves but in the scheme of things you know we're you know a moat in god's eye um yeah and uh and and that kind of realization of the world will move on and and one day no one will know we're here but what a you know what a precious thing life is and and uh yeah you know you know tuesdays with maury that mitch album wrote you know yeah i I remember that, that, that that's another a great book to kind of to, to kind of recognize yeah a few people will miss you maybe some people will sing my song for a few years but at some point <laughs> you know history will pass us by and and that's why as you said that's why make the most of what we have and you know and um and don't you know it's, it's stupid you know it's not stupid but you know the whole don't sweat the small stuff you know that's uh, i think no it's not stupid it's yeah, it's yeah. it's simple yeah it's but simple. it's not simple yeah. It's yeah. simple, but it's not yeah. easy. I think that's the, the expression. Yeah, I should have said it sounds know? trivial, but it's like, yeah, it's, it's simple is where it's at for songwriters, yeah. too. Yeah. yeah, I agree with you. 
Did that song get any traction, or has it? I could see it being licensed in so many different like movie endings or show endings. Has has that song got any traction or zero? <laughs> Nothing. You're kidding me. No, I I, I think no. I think very few people are aware of it, um, and that's you know that's the frustration of being a songwriter, and 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 you know sometimes what you feel may be your best work is is. Um, kind of I wouldn't say overshadowed but just it just for for whatever reason nobody finds it and and um and it just kind of has its own little place in 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 your catalog that uh but then you have moments in your life like I have where where I hear from you and mm. and I hear how the song means something to you and that oh. makes me emotional because yeah. you know every song you know Unless you're Elton or Billy Joel, you know, or the Beatles, every song's not going to be something people know. So sure. I also had a song called Freedom Never Cries that a lot of people don't know, but it became a, a song that's kind of a song for our, our troops and our military families. It's never on the radio. Um, I have songs now that have been had in the last you know, few years have tens of millions of impressions that are never on the radio. Um, yeah. So, you know, to have have songs that maybe obscure but find a place with people as a songwriter that you know that that is very rewarding as well is that an odd thing for you growing up initially in the sort of the big um opportunity phase of the music business and now you're measured by streams or likes or fans but like the reality is it doesn't necessarily drive the dollars into your pocket. <laughs> not that that's why, not that yeah. that's why you, you know, you don't make music, you know, nobody got into the music business because, Oh, I want to make a lot of money. But like, you know, if you hear something, Oh, this has got 10 million streams and you know, oh, we have a hundred thousand fans or whatever the number is like you in some weird way, you expect that to, Translate, translate into, <laughs> yeah. like social media currency does not translate into financial currency. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I was fortunate to catch the last wave, you know, when Superman yeah. was a hit. That was the year the the uh, record business sold the most records. And then, you know, everything collapsed. Of course, I, sure. I, I, I never made a penny from the record company, you know, because they they never recoup. They rarely do unless you're, you know, Beyonce. But yeah. um, but I did I did write my own songs right so that that was an income stream that that continues to go but no I, I worry a lot you know I think it's getting better but you know seven eight years ago I would talk about is music just becoming a hobby um, because there really is uh, especially before streaming was catching up um, it's really hard to make a living even if you know even if you kind of have you know hit songs and some success and it's it's dangerous I think for the culture if if the arts become a hobby and people can't make a living at it because we need the arts. Um, oh we need God, artists. Yeah. We need that. We need um, to teach kids the arts. You know, and we need songwriters and writers writing about the times so we can look back in history and say, oh, I get a sense of the times through music, just like you do through the 60s. Yeah. You know, we it's it's so critical. But if nobody can make a living, um, they have to get a real job. They have to, you know, they have to, they have a family, they have to pay a mortgage. Um, that's a big problem. And I think we, we saw some of that. And I actually think we see a little bit of that still. I, I mean, it's my job to be the curmudgeon. It was all good in my time. But, you know, how many songs do we have in the last 15, 20 years that you are going to hear 10, 20, 30, 40 years from now? I would argue not that it's, lot. it's not a lot as opposed to why are we still hearing the 70s every day, everywhere? You know, right. there's a reason for that. So uh, I think it has affected us. On the other hand, I have to admit, too, that, you know, the Internet um, has leveled the playing field and you don't yes. need you don't need a record company to have success. Um, you know, Bruce Springsteen broke on his third record. You know, that would never happen at a record company now. But, you know, artists find uh, a career. They find an audience through the Internet. and they, They're not beholden to to a big record company so I, I think in many ways that's healthy if you hear a song in the store and you just go on your app you you basically you you know what that song is and you can listen to yeah. it so and right. also for me there's a whole new generation finding my music through the algorithms and through spotify so so i i do think um i think things are, are coming back a little bit but look 
live touring, I think, uh, for many people now, um, is their income stream. And so, um, you know, I'm fortunate to, to be able to do that. But, um, but we can't get to a place where the arts become a hobby. And I think, I think that's, um, that's very dangerous. And, and we need to make sure, whether it's through the government or for whatever the royalties are on these things, that artists uh, are able to, to continue their craft. Um, oh, my God, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I certainly hope so, man. John, tell me the uh, top three musical experiences you've had. Certainly, the most uh, significant was the concert for New York uh, after 9 yeah, 11, playing it. Superman at uh, the concert for New York. Um, of course, any other night being on stage with all your living icons would have been the dream come true. <laughs> playing, you know, standing there and singing Let It Be with Paul McCartney. And what was that like, man? Yeah, I mean, it's there's no words for that. It's just surreal, and, <laughs> and you're like, how am I here? It's, and and um, but of course that night it was about the firefighters, you know, the families, mm. and so I think it was everybody kind of understood while we were there. I tried not to fanboy too much. So certainly, what Superman became for New York and the country after 9/11, that will be uh, I think the most significant thing I ever do. The the number two is actually. Um, very recent. Uh, I, I never thought I'd have experience like the concert for New York, but I, uh, after October 7th, the Hamas attacks, I wrote a song called OK, We're Not OK, kind yep, of about the collapse about of our moral institutions, and then it became this big thing globally, and particularly for Jewish people. I'm not Jewish, but the song um, has resonated around the world, and I had the opportunity uh, two months ago to go to Israel between, I had a week off of my tour, and I performed Superman and OK at Hostage Square um, for 10,000 Israelis and hostage families in the country uh, and Jewish people around the world that was broadcast, which really reminded me a lot of the concert for New York, you know, playing yeah. a song, and 10 feet in front of me, there's, there's a woman with a, a sign of her son who's being held hostage by terrorists. Um, crying um, with music, providing hopefully a little bit of solace for her, or a little bit of hope. So that, I think, um, is also, to me, those two, I think, are the most significant. Um, as far as the, the, the third one, I mean, God, I've had so many, <laughs> I've had so many amazing moments. I would have to say, I'll, I'll do a selfish one now. Yeah. Um, playing Dodger Stadium, for the Kings Ducks outdoor game, um, huge five for fighting, huge hockey fan, Dodger Stadium where I'd sit in the bleachers and catch foul ball, you know, you know, batting practice and catch home runs to sit at home plate with all that legacy and have my my mom and dad in the audience um, to sing there uh, was a life moment that that certainly. Um, was incredible and amazing and i've had some great sports moments so probably the rest of them are all sports moments <laughs> that's very cool man yeah i read about that that's awesome let's talk about okay we are not okay so you wrote this song in support of israel and condemning hamas you made a statement in an interview john as a rhetorical question it says how did we get to a place where our music stars can't condemn pure atrocities i would like to know your take on why we are not okay. Why do so many things seem broken nowadays? In particular, just my opinion, people's ability to get along with each other and tolerate opinions that are contrary to how they feel and their hateful reactions and consequences to these differences, which, which usually take place on the most gutless medium possible of the cell phone and social media. Yeah, right. I mean, like, uh, you know, you have kids. I remember... When my daughter was 11, she's 24 now, there was a kid asking her on social media, this was 13 years ago, so it was kind of like early on, for a hand job. Oh, God. And, and I, when she was 11, and I said yeah. to her, I said, Sam, you know, this guy would probably never even have the courage to say hello to you in person. But, you know, he's got all the balls in the world distanced through a computer or a cell phone. Uh, anyway, but how the hell do you think we got here? And why is everything so freaking broken? I mean, that could be a two-hour conversation. <laughs> I, mean, I don't have all the answers. We need you know. alcohol for that. <laughs> yeah, and, and, you know, people are analyzing. I mean, I think, I think you, you know, you can cer certainly start talking about the Internet 
and um, you know the the couch warriors who can you know can can spew you know whatever venom they like without consequence and also I think for the kids you know seeing what's happening in the world around you on Instagram every day and oh I'm not invited here I'm not invited there they said this about me um, certainly is not helpful and also we've become all you know so many people have, have basically um, uh, decided to live in a silo of very people don't you don't have to go out you don't have to meet people you don't have to learn social graces you don't have to have hard conversations with somebody in front of your face you don't have to be accountable for some of the things you said as you said in front of your face and so I think I think that's part of it I think also um, it was interesting when I was in Israel I, I met with a uh, kind of an iconic freedom fighter Natan Sharansky uh, a refusenik and um, and he said, you know, 20 years ago, somebody asked me, what's the biggest threat to freedom in the Western world? And he said, American academia, which I think we're seeing. Um, yeah. when, when academia kind of um, is dominated by this kind of woke idea, anti-American idea, and, and the faculty is teaching this oppressor versus oppressee, America's bad, all this stuff to kids um, who are very, you know, seductive at that age yeah they're very moldable um, and and um and they're taught that you know it's not about right or wrong it's about oppressed versus oppressee you you understand why half the kids on tiktok support an evil uh, you know barbaric hamas um they don't know better and and what i always figured would happen is you know 15 years ago when when those indoctrinated kids would get out of school they'd have to get a job they'd have to have a paycheck they'd have to pay taxes and their worldview would change but it didn't. Now a lot of those folks are running the New York Times. They're running uh, the news media. They're running big business. So I think that kind of, um, that along with cancel culture and everybody's afraid. But I think the music industry is a very good example of how broken we are because, you know, what do you think about the music industry? You think about human rights. You think about people who speak truth to power. You think about the 60s, um, the civil rights movement. You think about right. Live Aid. You think about Sun City. You think about the concert for New York, all these things, okay, we're going to stand up for what is right. We don't care what the consequences are. We're going to write songs about it. We are rock and roll. But af after October 7th, um, when, you know, Hamas put babies in oven, you know, um, murdered, raped, uh, desecrated uh, bodies at the Nova concert, um, no musicians can stand up and say, that is evil. Release the hostages. I don't say we love Israel. My song is not about Israel. No, and, and it's uh, not about politics either. It's, it's, it's civilization against those who want to tear it down. Yeah. You know? it, it, and so the fact that the music industry, the agents, the, you know, the artists, with very few exceptions, have remained quiet um, about condemning these, um, these barbaric acts Many of the artists, Jewish, that are refusing to condemn it, just shows we've lost our soul. We're paralyzed. We're cowards. Um, and that is very dangerous. You know, we've already lost the media in my mind. But when you lose the arts, the soul of the arts, because people are afraid to say, um, killing children, um, you know, um, and uh, committing atrocities, um, we can't talk about that because somebody may say something. Uh, I may lose a, uh, an audience member. Somebody may protest my concert. Um, if, if that's where we are, it, it's a scary time. And um, the fact that it shouldn't be me that has this song that's talking about this stuff. It should be someone with bigger platforms who've made their career saying that they are the ones that, that, um, that speak up for all these good things. Uh, so that's a long rant for you. I'll stop there. But uh, no, no, it, is, no, it is it is honest. a shame. It's, our, it's, it's a historic honest. shame for our industry that I think no. uh, history will will judge us um, appropriately. Thank you, man. I appreciate you being so candid on that. Uh, again, to whatever extent you're comfortable answering this, have there been like negative consequences for oh, yeah. you for speaking out? Of course. Yeah. yeah. I mean. I, I mean, besides, I mean, yeah. besides people saying, "Hey, you're a fucking asshole, man." You know, I mean, I, that's uh, that just goes with the territory nowadays. Well, you know, it started. I actually wrote a song about Afghanistan after the withdrawal called "Blood on My Hands," mm. and um, 
it was a song that was very critical of abandoning our allies and American citizens. Again, these things are not hard to me. That you was know, a great song, Bob. Thank way. you. I mean, the to me, the moral message is like, the blood of my hands is, you don't promise, a, you know, Af the whole nation of, of Afghanistan that will have your back if something goes bad and then plunge them into Game of Thrones. Yeah. Um, you, you know, I wrote a song about Ukraine. I went to Ukraine and played with the Ukrainian orchestra. You know, um, that song. Which, by the way, when you did that, Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but yeah. your like joy doing that was like it was very. You could see that, you know, it was really cool to watch. Well, you know, so powerful to to perform in hollow ground in a blown up airport in front of the symbol of their independence with these incredible Ukrainian, you know, many of them kind of more elderly orchestra members. But they'd all lost a family member. They'd have somebody missing. Uh, they were teaching me curse words in Ukrainian to curse words. <laughs> it, it was a surreal experience. But, but again, all these songs to me are moral messages. Yeah. Um, and but of course, in this day and age, um, everything's political. So of course, there's been pushback. You know, we sent blood on my hands, and we sent OK to 400 music media outlets. Two of them covered it. Uh, when I played Hostage Square, um, a moment that you would think would be significant in. Um, you know, here's this American artist, here's this song that's globally thing, Here, here's a guy playing Hostage Square. You know, the Rolling Stones of the world refuse to cover it because of their worldview. And um, so <clears throat> I, I've certainly got the, you know, the threats and the vitriol that anybody Jew, I'm not, as I said, I'm not Jewish, but I've learned a little bit what it's like to be Jewish. And uh, you do get, you know, it, it's, um, it's some, uh, some performances, there's been some folks that are very unhappy um, I haven't gotten the, the kind of physical stuff that, you know, I haven't had a concert canceled right. like Mattis Yahoo did or Michael yeah. Rappaport did. Um, but, you know, in the music business, which supposedly is, is this tolerant place that is very intolerant, a lot of the stuff is passive. <laughs> it's like, you know, I'm not going to use that guy's song. I hate that guy. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to hire him for this. On the other hand, I have gotten hundreds of emails and sometimes phone calls of people in the music business saying thank you for saying this thank you for um, speaking up thank you for saying this um especially you know kind of jewish folks in the business so it's like anything if if you're not getting hatred and people aren't angry at you you're probably not doing anything significant so yeah. i think with all these songs and how the media goes back and forth. Oh, we, we hate blood on my hands. Oh, we love Come On Man Save the World. Good morning, America. We'll preview it there. It's just, I just think it's an example of, again, again, how we're kind of broken as a society where morality shouldn't be based on how is this going to affect my political party? Is it what good or What side are you on? Yeah, yeah, man. It shouldn't matter, like, is this going to help us or hurt us? It should be, this is right, this is wrong. Let the rest of it fall where it's made. And I think, I think we've become so tribal I think, you know, especially in the media that, you know, people always talk about a threat to democracy, you know, and we don't get polit you know, political here. It's like Donald Trump, Kamala Harris, Joe Biden, they're not threats to democracy. The collapse of the fourth estate is, um, yeah. of the media is. So I think um, we're in a very dangerous place and the world's in a are. very dangerous place. And what do songwriters do or what did they used to do? They'd write about it. They'd shout about it. Man. They'd shout about it. Yeah. And there are some, you know, Macklemore's shouting about, you know, Israel's an oppressor, you know, they're horrible. Okay, that's fine. You know, that's a one world view. But for the, uh, the rest of us who have a different world view, why is everybody so afraid to express that? And I would say the consequences are so great that if you don't, you know, the last image of my video, of the OK video, is Martin Luther King's quote. Yeah. You know, silence the face of evil is complicity. And yeah. sadly, in our business, there's a hell of a lot of complicity going on. Yeah, man. I agree with you. Thank you again for all of that. Ego. You mentioned in an interview, and you talked about it earlier, that uh, you're in a very ego-driven business. How has ego helped you at times and hindered you at times throughout your career? It's another very good question. Thank you. I'm, I'm becoming very sad now, Craig. This is your last episode. We can call each other and give each other therapy like twice a month. <laughs> yeah, a bottle of whiskey. Um, um, I, I was actually having this conversation. I had a performance just this last weekend with some, um, some 
you know, some some other rock star. Not I'm not a rock star, but some people much more famous than me. And we we're talking about about ego. And I, I was saying to somebody, I forget who, you know, the hardest thing to do, but the most important thing is to turn it off when you walk off stage, right? Because you need ego, you need confidence, you need bravado, you need um, you need this ability to to um, to quench the fear of being a performer and being an artist. You have to have that, or you're, you're not going to be very good. Yeah. But it's hard sometimes to turn that off when you walk off stage. And if you live your whole life of like I am that guy, it usually ends badly. Yeah. So I think I think having ego having confidence is critical as is as having some humility to understand that um first of all you're human and um you're never going to be you're never going to do a perfect performance you're never going to write the perfect song um but also at the end of the day um i'm not a i'm not a soldier you know saving the world and flying you know driving a tank you know i'm not a policeman rescuing it's like a lot of these people, you know, I'm not the, that guy who ran into those buildings at 9-11. It's like, it's yeah. like there are true heroes. One, one blessing of my career is I've met true heroes, real heroes. Yeah. Um, some I can't even say their names because, you know, <laughs> they're, um, uh, and, and many you'll never know their names. But um, I think to have that, that gratitude of I have this platform, I'm going to use it. Um, I'm going to have the ego to to say what I say and do what I do and take what comes back with it. But then the humility, humility to realize that really what I do as an artist is we shine the light on causes and people who deserve it. Um, we live in such a shallow celebrity culture where, you know, oh. we're, we're, we're the ones who are famous, rich and famous and athletes. But if you're fortunate enough to have that platform, you can use it to shine the light on Augie Nieto, my ALS guy, our troops, yeah. our military families, um, these causes with Ukraine and Israel and, and Afghanistan. So I, I think it, it's a hard tightrope and you never get it right and you make mistakes. Uh, but I think like any of this, the key is to be aware of it. If we're just aware of it, okay, okay, yeah. we have this thing, it's important to what we do, but you know, if we, if we get too close to the fire, you know, um, get too close to the sun, we know what's going to happen, right? Yeah. But, um, but, you know, especially, you know, we're com- and we also have to embrace, look, you know, again, I talk about men a lot and, and certainly women have too, but men, you know, we're competitive. Yeah. Okay? We want to win. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we fight, we fight, you know, for the good fight. And there's nothing wrong with that. In, in, some, in fact, there's something beautiful about that. Absolutely. You know, that's why, you know, that's why, um, that's, that's why, why our wives love us, man. Well, that's right. And that's why we love our wives. And that's why we love each other. Yeah, um, right. And, and, um, but part of that is, is stepping out of that, too, and, and understanding sometimes we lose. And sometimes it's important to lose. And sometimes yeah. the best times are left when we lose and, and take that. But again, you know, it's, it's always a work in progress. Um, but without my ego, I can guarantee you we would not be talking. Because the, the only reason I stuck this thing out so long, and it's... I'm not proud of saying it. It wasn't because I love music so much. It was because I was going to go down. I was going to go down in flames. Uh, I was either going to win or go down in flames. And, um, and at the end of the day, you know, probably the perseverance of, of ego is, again, why I stuck it out till you know, I hit the lottery. Yeah. yeah. And I really appreciate all your honest answers. Thank you so much. It, yeah, sure. Really yeah. Awesome, man. Low points, John. What were some of the low points or dark periods you've had to deal with in life, and how'd you get through them? I'll talk about two, and one's music-related, and another's not. Um, uh, when I was on EMI, I made my first record. The um, president of the record, uh, the label, is a guy named David Segerson, and I loved it because he was a producer. He was actually a music producer. Uh, he produced Tori Amos's Little Earthquakes, incredible record. He produced The Bangles. So I'm like, here I am with... Uh, a music producer running the label. He produced my record. It's, what could be better, right? And then EMI record closes, <laughs> and <laughs> and and no other label would pick me up. And I was in my kind of mid twenties, and I had to get a job. And um, I, you know, Carla had written this with me, and I was at that place where many artists are, where okay, I can't keep doing this because I have to. I'm gonna get married. I'm gonna 
got to pay the rent. And I was working at the family business. And I cut off all my hair. I started putting a suit on, going to work. And Carla, this was... The, this wow, was, that took balls, man. Well, here's what that took balls. A... Here's what took balls. I come home two days later, and, my, and she wasn't my wife at the time, but my girlfriend, she had cut her hair off, too. To oh, in support of you. In support of me. And I cry that, when I even think about that. And she is a, she's a cool, supermodel. Man. She's like, you know, she's like a gorgeous. And, and, and so... And so I was basically like, okay, I got to like, got to provide, you know, and, and, uh, but I didn't know that unbeknownst to me, she was still setting out my demos to, to companies and, and that's how she found to wear records and then kind of the stars aligned. But that kind of moment of, okay, I, I gave it the shot. You know, I was just talking about ego, um, without my wife, you know, that wouldn't matter. But that moment was, you know, very frustrating but you know, Superman came out of that. Um, yeah. You know, Superman came out of that experience. I, you know, probably, wow. you know, I probably wouldn't have written Superman if I hadn't had that, that, uh, that collapse. That, that so many artists have that story. Other record company close. The other um, very challenging time for for me was recently during the pandemic. Uh, my dad was eighty five. Was well, he's eighty three, so he had a quarantine. And our family business is downtown LA and hotbed for COVID, 300 employees, many of them been with us 20, 30 years, um, sales collapsing, but because we make carts, we're an essential business, so we don't shut down. A uh, lot of people getting COVID, so trying to keep people healthy, trying to sustain my father's business legacy that's been in the family 100 years, um, trying to keep, you know, myself you know upright you know going down there at two in the morning and taking temperatures of guys um and and all the stuff you know that went into COVID was probably the most challenging thing that ever happened and and i talk about this in my keynote too about uh you know i had to make decisions that i'd never thought i went to therapy i got some medicine um because it was a lot of stress and and I talk about taking care of yourself first. You know, my came, I said, take care of yourself first because then you can take care of everyone else. I'd always say that, but I never lived it. <laughs> I never lived it. And then I'm, I'm driving on the 405 at like, you know, five in the morning one day, like halfway through COVID and there's no one on it. It's like the twilight zone and I'm exhausted. I'd lost 15 pounds. I'm, I'm like, you know, just, and I'm like, you know what? You, you, you talk about this thing about taking care of yourself first. Maybe you should think about that. And yeah. so I, I, you know, I did, I got, you know, I got some of the psych meds and I started sleeping better and, and Good. it kind of, you know, so I made it, but that was really, that was really hard for so many, for all of us. But, um, but we, you know, we made it through and we got everybody through, you know, we had two guys that, that uh, were on ventilators for 20 days and all that stuff. And, but we got everybody through, we got the business through and um, my dad's back working 24 seven, you know, 85 years old. So, uh, but that was that. That for me was was a brutal, you know, brutal. Um, well, you time. had a lot of pressure on you that oh. came out of nowhere. Yeah, that's a and there's no frame of reference to like manual to go back. It's like raising yeah. kids. Like, what do you you know? It's like, what do you look at to figure yeah. out? How Every to day was it. like a, a brand new kind of you know. Nobody's been here before. What do we do? And uh, but you know, again, I was I was happy that I was in a place in my life where I could do that for my dad because I, my parents were the ones that really supported me. If I didn't have Precision Wire to work at while I was pursuing my career, I would just never, I would never be able to do it, you know? So, yeah. so in a way it was, I felt, you know, um, I felt grateful to be able to do a little pay it, pay it back. Payback. Yeah, parents. sure. Man. Yeah. You know, yeah. Good. That's awesome. I'm glad you guys all got through that. Yeah. Uh, I guess we touched on this a little bit. Well, what do you, which one of your personality or which of your personality traits do you think have most contributed to your success? Um, well, we talked about ego and perseverance. Um, I, I think um, also having my parents, it's not a personality trait, but having a great support, you know, from my parents and, you know, and, and Carla and other folks, I, I think was important. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a hard worker. Uh, I think work ethic is so critical to this. You know, oh, very, dude. very few of the, very few of us are prodigy 
writers. So I think so much of it is just doing the work. Um, yeah. I, I'd say this again in my keynote. You know, I'll write 100 songs to get 10 for a record. I wrote right. thousands of songs before Superman. Uh, I once calculated I worked 40,000 hours before I made a penny in the music business. So, so much, I think, of, <laughs> of success is, 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 um, is work ethic. And another thing I talk about, too, is relationships. I think whatever you do, I think relationships, again, are, are, are more critical than, than talent and, and building relationships. And, and whenever I talk to young bands who have success, initial success, I say, you know, what will go a long way for you is, is if you're the same person when you have the number one song in the, in the country as you were when you were nobody walking into these program directors begging for a spin. Um, so if you can kind of keep some humility uh, when you have success, that I think is a big part of it. So I, I think my ability to kind of stay kind of grounded, I've never been part of the music scene. I don't, I don't go to the parties. Right. I don't get invited to the parties. I have precision wire. I have like, I have, I don't get invited to parties. I don't get, yeah, I'm not that guy, you know? I, <laughs> and, and so I, I think, I I think like kind that. of, just kind of understanding how lucky I am to do music, but not have it consume me as this is only who I am, you know? Because yeah. Because it's going to go bad. You know, I have a lot of friends who uh, who had, you know, who hits in the 2000s who are really struggling now because, oh, God. Yeah. you know, it's 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 tough to have that and then have it go away. And and you write a great song and you're like, wow, it would have been a hit in 2004. <laughs> it's like, you know, yeah. that that that's tough. I mean, I, I struggle with that. I took a year off sure. and I was depressed for a year. But so maybe, you know, kind of having that my parents kind of instituted this kind of love of family and, and support staff, um, which gave me a little, I think, perspective on, on relationships and work ethic and all that stuff. But um, I don't know if that's a good answer, but that's... No, it's, it's honest. Yeah. Very good answer. Yeah. A couple of things, uh, comments on that. You know, I'm such a stickler for work ethic. I almost judge... Uh, to me, you can... If someone doesn't have a good work ethic, I'm like... I just almost don't even want any part of them because it's such a strong symbolism of how you run the rest of your life. Do you take shortcuts? Are you give? You know what I'm saying? I think it's such an important defining category of of a human being, and lack of it is as well. And uh, the other thing I was thinking of you, which probably helps you, you probably have left and right brain. <laughs> strength because of your parent your dad's an astrophysicist your mom's a musician you know what i mean and and that's that's a gift because i've talked to you know most musicians i've spoken to but you know listen let's face it that's and it's no secret and this is not a smear on musicians like they're allergic to business they're allergic yeah. to marketing to their detriment unfortunately you know um like i've had guys on the show um you know, like early on, I said, hey, you know, John, what can we promote today? I, I want to support my guests, yeah. right? And, oh, I got nothing. I'm like, don't you have a new record? And they're like, uh, yeah, but I'm like, well, this shit's not going to promote itself. <laughs> like, you're here. Let, let me at least, man. you know, it's like they're really allergic to it. It's, it's unfortunate, you know? It's, uh, well, yeah. I think, you know, I think that I should have mentioned that earlier, but I think you're right. I think my experience working at Precision Wire paid a lot of dividends in the music business. Because again, I think my business acumen and experience, again, is way more important than any talent I have. Without that, um, we wouldn't be talking again. Uh, developing relationships, um, how to handle failure, um, the fact that, you know, Fight for Fighting is not a band, it's, it's a guy. Mm. And so, yeah. so, you know, so you know, running that business, who do you, who do you hire um, for your band, and who are those? Are those good people? Do they represent you well? Um, right. You know, a lot of it. You know, who do you hire as a manager? Who do you work with? Who do you not work with? Um, all those decisions that go to running a business. Um, trying to understanding that um, very early that it's very unlikely you will sustain the success. So, you know, saving your money, investing properly. You know, I, we have so many friends who've had you know you know, have hit the stratosphere success wise success success wise and and have have blown all their their, their money, you know. It's yeah, like, pissed away so, their money on velvet couches. Or yeah. Like you know, so yeah. so I think 
so especially today when you can do it yourself. Um, like Madonna was an amazing businessman, <laughs> businesswoman, business yeah. person. You know, you look at some of these people. Gene Simmons, right? Um, oh my God! Incredible yeah. businessman, right? So you you can kind of go through you know some of these folks and you see, uh, yeah, they have the thing, they do their thing, but but in many respects, why are they icons? Either they're they're great business people or they understand they need to get great people around them to do it. Yes. So, so yeah, so the. I think the business stuff for me has been really critical. Yeah, I would agree with cool. that. Um, do you have a favorite song you wrote? Oh, <laughs> it's it's the day I died today. Um. <laughs> <laughs> it's my favorite song you wrote. Yeah. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I think uh, they're all your kids, right? Everybody says your songs to your kids. I think, That's what Joe Satriani said to yeah, me. Yeah, and it's like, it's like, who's your favorite kid? I, I do think, you know, as I is now that I'd be 60, um, I think 100 Years for Me um, yeah. is a song that, that um, never gets old to me because we're all in there. Uh, it lives with me. It still seems as fresh as when I wrote it. Of course, that it's had its impact in the culture helps. But, you know, as, as far as kind of the popular songs... If I could only take one, you know, it'd probably be 100 years. Yeah, that's cool, man. Uh, tell me your top three Desert Island discs, just for now, because that changes all the time. Abbey Road, um, Tommy. Oh, my God, what a great record. Not enough people mention that. That's yeah. such a great record, yeah. And um, Stevie Wonder's Songs in the Key of Life. Yeah, that, that's a great, yeah. great record. Yeah. John, tell me about a change you made or a specific experience you had that changed either your outlook on life or your outlook on yourself. Hmm. Well, I think the most defining moment in education for me, and we've talked about it, was the concert for New York because I learned that night um, how music can matter in ways that I never recognized. And it wasn't my performance. It was actually The Who when they played Bob O'Reilly and the roof blew off Madison Square Garden. Dude, and I looked up and you, you saw 20,000 people, many of them who'd been down at ground zero, digging through the rubble, you know, finding body parts. And like, they hadn't had a chance to like release. And they all came to Madison Square Garden and The Who blows, and everybody's singing, screaming, crying. People are hugging families. And I'm like, and I'm just sitting this little kid on the side stage. I'm like, okay, that's why we do this. This is why music matters. Yeah. And that started my relationships with the troops and my um, performing for USO and, and for doing these causes because I, you know, autism, whatever it is. Because um, I learned that night, okay, you have, the, you have this song that's impacting in ways you never could imagine. So how do you... You know, you could just, you know, cash it in fame and fortune and do all that. Or you can you can use that and learn um, and continue to whether they're hit songs or not, to try to to try to write songs that have significance, not just success. Um, and sometimes you have both. Um, but I think that that change in my brain about why are we doing this? And uh, it's not necessarily about having a number one song, but having a song that impact. You're a perfect example of The Day I Died, a song very few people know, but having songs that impact people, maybe it's one person, maybe it's one billion people, but I think that that outlook as a songwriter is a healthy one, and I yeah. think the concert for New York, New York kind of instilled that in me. That's awesome. That Bob O'Reilly, I mean, I remember the first time that I heard that opening, it's just like, a, your ear. it's like a magnet for your ears, man. It's like, you cannot not listen to that thing, man, you know? Such a great track. So good. Hey, what are the, you mentioned that you're going to be 60, I'm 60. What's the most important lessons you've learned from getting older? Um, you know, again, we talked about it, you know, have, have some gratitude for what you do have. Be grateful for what you do have. Um, be grateful to live in a free country, you know, in a country oh, that God, has yeah. freedoms and, 
and uh, meritocracy. You know, when you when you uh, when you go to you do stuff for Afghanistan, you go to Ukraine, and you do you know you, you go to Cuba. You know, I played at Gitmo, and you know we a lot of the stuff we take for granted. You know, so I think to be grateful for that, um, and um, you know I think. Um, to, to, I'm very grateful that right now at, at Precision Wire, I have my dad and my son, we're all working together. We have a window That's for that. Cool. So I think a lot of it is to take a step back. And uh, I think part of it is I'm not writing two or 300 songs a year. You know, I'm kind of writing when I feel like it. And I'm, I'm, I'm working with people on projects that, that inspire me. I think we get to a point in our life, and I think you're kind of you're kind of having that epiphany in the last month. Yeah. At some point, we get to a point where we've been grinding, we've been doing a lot, maybe we made some security, and we've been working hard, but at some point, let's, let, you know, assuming that I, I have the means, let, let me do things that move me with people I like um, yeah. and with people that inspire me, and, and let me do things that have joy. Maybe they go, maybe they don't, but... Whatever I'm doing, be surrounded with people that are inspiring me, and and, and maybe say no once in a while. The word no can be oh, hard. Oh, dude, to... that's a powerful word. Man. Yeah, may, maybe you know it took me 20 years to learn to say no, um, but you yeah. know that's a very important word. So I, I I think when we get to this age in our life, you know, um, people always say you know the best is yet to come. I think I think it is because a lot yeah. of it now is on our own terms, and we make, can make decisions that we may would, may not make five ten years ago and. And I'm so excited for you, Craig. You know, to thank uh, you, man. To um, you know, I you know <laughs> Thanks, your your John. smile. You you seem relaxed. <laughs> you seem you're like you know. It's like it's and and for many of us, we never make that decision. We never make that decision. I don't care what age we are. So it's a big deal. It's a really big deal. And I think we can all be inspired. Um, as much as you got to send me a T-shirt because I want to wear my T-shirt. You know, <laughs> I want to wear my T-shirt. To support, you know, to, uh, but but yeah, sometimes change can be the hardest thing to do, the hardest decisions to make. You know, change is always hard, but sometimes when you make it, you're like, "What took me so long?" <laughs> oh, dude, it was just like a box. It was like a literally a million pound weight off my my shoulders, and I'm just so happy. You know, and I, the greatest blessing in my life has been my wife and that relationship, and I kind of like you or you implied you know i'm married way above my yeah. pay grade and, we have that uh, in common <laughs> yeah <laughs> and uh you know to not honor that the way i need to you know of course my wife was like holy shit what if i hate you and you're around all the time <laughs> <laughs> be careful what I you say, wish well, for <laughs> i know i say we'll be fine don't worry which everything's cool uh, but, uh, yeah, so I was just, you know, I just, I've made so, I've, I've made so many bad decisions. I said, you know, I had to start making some good ones. You know, even a broken clock's right twice a day, John, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and thank you for your support and kindness. Uh, hey, what do you like most about yourself? Oh, my God, that is, I, you know, I, that's you know, a question that everybody stops dead. <laughs> you know, I, I think, you know. <laughs> I think if you know if you need somebody uh, in a tough time, I think I'm there. Um, yeah. Uh, and I'm not always, you know, I'm not always as engaged as I probably should be with things. But I, I think you know I'm a loyal, I am a loyal person. Mm -hmm. I think I'm a fair person. Mm -hmm. um, kind of traits my father has. Um, I appreciate that I work hard. And I, you know, I, I appreciate, you know, that, that I have um, decided to say some things that very few people want to say. And, and, I, and, and the, the, that, um, whatever you want to call that, that. Uh, it's called that, courage, man. Well, I, I, you know, yeah. they, they, say, they say courage is contagious and also cowardice is contagious. So, oh. you know, so I, I, I take a little bit of satisfaction that not only am I saying things people won't say, but. It seems to be making a dent in the culture and, and giving people some some um, some solace and also some spine to 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 take it upon themselves to to uh, not that I'm always right, but just to speak just to speak their mind because yeah. for some reason in this culture people uh, uh, are afraid to do that and that's not a healthy place. 
No, it's not. What's really weird about it is in past cultural revolutions, it was about, as you implied earlier, having a voice, speaking yeah. more. And it's interesting to see this, and maybe I'm just a silly old man at this point, I don't know, but it seems like, hey, don't have a voice is the message of this cultural revolution. I'm like, I don't really get that one, but, you know, it's just weird, different. You know, as a songwriter, you're always listening, and Silly Old Man is a good title, good song title. There you go. So, uh, so for all the songwriters on here, always be listening. <laughs> you might be there hearing Silly Old Man. <laughs> Well, Craig send it to me after you write it. <laughs> no, from Craig and John. <laughs> uh, toughest decision you had to make, or most difficult decision you ever, most difficult thing you ever had to do. Oh, that's interesting. You know, I, I haven't, I haven't had like um, a, a, a complete crossroad. I mean, certainly when EMI closed, and I'm like, okay. I'm going to go get a real job and do that it was difficult, but it was almost by necessity. Right. And when COVID hit, it wasn't really a decision. I was going to do that. Um, I was going to do that. Um, maybe my most difficult decisions ahead of me. And when I find it, I'll let you know. <laughs> let me know, man. I'll, I'll, I'll actually know. Call, I'll call, no, I'll call you for advice. <laughs> oh, I don't know about that. I can <laughs> really, People always, often people ask me for advice because they think if you're on a platform, you're really smart. <laughs> they don't realize it's just I don't know the, what the fuck is going on any more than anybody else. Uh, but that's an interesting one. People always say, how did you stay married so long? I'm like, I, I only have one experience. I don't really, I can't really tell. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't have all these experiences. So it's like, I don't know. I'm always weird on advice. Last question, John, and I want to thank you so much, and it's such a joy to have met you, and uh, you know, thank you for everything you didn't know that you did for me that you did for me. Oh. Um, what's been the biggest change in your personality over the last 10 years, and has that change been intentional or just a, you know, a function of aging? Probably both. Um, hopefully we get a little wiser, and we, um, maybe we get a little more contemplative you know i would say I'm, I'm a little more mellow but if you see me on tv these days i'm always ranting about something um, <laughs> but yeah but, but that's different that's like yeah. you're you're in your yeah. role you're in your you're yeah. in that spot you know yeah. that's your kind of like your job at that time you know yeah. it's like you, you, nobody wants to see a mellow performer you know yeah like yeah. like laid back you got and be also the, su the subject matter i'm talking about is not something that is just like you know have a cup yeah. of coffee and like, you know, I, I think, you know, maybe the best way to state it is I, I think I breathe a little deeper Good for um, you, man. than I did uh, before. I'm still struggling with that. I, I still have, you know, certainly after October 7th and some of the stuff I've done, it, it creates some mania and some stress. Yeah, but sure. um, but I, I, I think I breathe a little deeper. Uh, I look at the sky a little longer. Um, I, um, I appreciate my kids now that we're empty nesters like you I, yeah I, I appreciate things i appreciate my health yeah man more you know you oh know, we, god yeah you know we all have we all have aches and pains we all have these things that never go yeah. away so every day we wake up you know, like oh, that doesn't hurt quite as bad as it did yesterday you know i appreciate you know my health i appreciate my parents you know i, I think I, I just think i'm a more grateful person but that also inspires me to to to, to get off my ass and do stuff that matters too. So it's kind of this weird dichotomy of, okay, breathe, enjoy, like, you know, finally you're here, you don't have all those stresses, but also it's like, I do have this platform and I do have these things and, and uh, while we're here, we need to make a dent in this world. So it's, uh, it's kind of going back and forth, but, um, but yeah, it'll be in, you know, I'll be 60 next year and, and um, I'm looking forward to, you know, the next 20, 30 years. And, and I'm, I'm thinking it's going to be the best part of my life. I'm planning on that. And uh, it's an honor to be with you on, on your last show. Congratulations Thank you, man. on such Thank an incredible run. All my, all my buddies, Pete Thorne, Greg Saran, uh, Randy <laughs> Cook, 
you know, everybody loves you and your podcast. And I know you're going to keep, you. you know, keeping music and, and keep doing yeah. stuff. I look forward to the next thing you do, because at some point your wife will kick you out for a day. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I'll call you for advice. Yeah, I don't know a, what it's, to do. It's, with it's that an now. honor and congratulations. And, and, and thank you so much for, for having me on this, you know, very significant moment for you. Thank you so much, Sean. I appreciate it. Hey, let me tell people where to find you, what you got going on. So uh, John's got a bunch of tours coming up, rock tours as well as string quartets. And I would love you to go check him out at one of his concerts. And his, everything will be listed on fiveforfighting.com on his website. Also, please follow him and like him and whatever the proper adverbs are. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Five for Fighting on Facebook, John Andrasik, O N D R A S I K on Twitter, and Five for Fighting Music on Instagram. John, any final words of wisdom? Just sending love to all my fellow musicians and fellow folks out there, and uh, you know, keep up the good fight and uh, keep on singing. That's uh, that's what we're here for. Right on, man. Well, I appreciate everything. And uh, everybody, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this interview, share it on your socials with your friends. Uh, thanks so much to John and Drastic. We appreciate him coming on the show. And uh, most important, remember that happiness is a choice. I think I've said that at the end of every single show I've had here. So uh, be nice. Go play your guitar or whatever it is you're doing and have fun. And uh, Peace and love, everybody. I am out. John, thanks so much. Hang on a second. We'll wrap up.